Uh, Good morning. Turn to John chapter 8. That's where we're going to be this morning. Uh, We are in a series on freedom and being set free, uh, bound by shackles no more. Last week we talked about the freedom uh, as a Christian living um, in the United States of America under our civil authorities and under our government and what type of attitude and approach we should take to that. The week before we talked about being set free from sin and today I'm going to be talking about a very specific sin being sexual immorality or sexual sin. I remember the first time I was exposed to pornography, I was in the fifth grade. And I was exposed to sexual sin at a much earlier age than that. Nudity, um, abuse, and it's something that has always been unfortunately embedded in my mind. Sexual sin is one of those things that doesn't go away too easily. And it's something that forever stays with you. Something like anger, you can control And it it doesn't rear its ugly head, but sexual sin is different. And the Bible says the reason why sexual sin is different is because it's a sin against your own body. It's impressed upon your own mind, upon your heart, upon your identity. And it sticks with you throughout your whole life. And unfortunately, it's a struggle that, if I were honest, I would say that I still deal with today. As a heterosexual, um, it seems like this culture bombards us with nudity, images, in our movies, on the TV screen. You can't even watch, it seems like, a decent show without there being some type of sexual reference. Satan has waged war against the church, and I think if you were to ask every man in this auditorium, he would agree with that same struggle, that sexual immorality is is a satanic attack that we are all under. Now more than ever, women have been exposed, believe it or not, Um, statistics do show that women are addicted to pornography almost as much as men now. It used to be really a a struggle for for man, but now it also extends to women. Uh, We all, in reality, struggle with this. Let Let me read you a few statistics about the war of pornography. It's a $13 billion industry. 24% of smartphone owners admit to having pornographic material on 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 their phone. That means one out of every four people in this auditorium who has a smartphone has some form of pornography on there. 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women struggle with pornography. That's, that's high. That's, that's almost out of every four men in this room, three of them struggle with porn. It's self-described um, in this sense that those who call them f- themselves fundamental Christians, and there is an interesting correlation here, those who call themselves fundamental hardcore Christians, 91% of them struggle with pornography. All of these statistics are taken, by the way, from an online website called Covenant Eyes, and it's a very wonderful website. It offers programs and accountability software for your phones, for your computers, for your tablets, um, for your emails. It's, it's really a wonderful thing. And these are the statistics that they've reported. 67% of young men and 49% of young women say viewing porn is an acceptable way to express one's sexuality. And this is general. Think about this. Nine out of ten boys are exposed to porn before the age 18. Nine out of ten. Six out of ten girls. Sixty-eight percent of divorce cases involved one party meeting a new lover over the internet. Facebook's a wonderful tool, but yet I cannot tell you how many marriages have been wrecked because so-and-so met up with a high school sweetheart and now a marriage has ended. Fifty-six percent of divorce cases involved one party having an obsessive interest in pornographic websites, and 70% of wives um, of sex addicts could be diagnosed with PTSD. It really, really affects our marriages. Here's a quote from the U.S. Department of Justice. Never before in the history of telecommunications media in the United States has so much indecent and obscene material been so easily accessible by so many minors in so many American homes with so few restrictions. Sexual sin is a touchy, top, uh, touchy topic, as you, as you can tell. It is something that we all struggle with. The Bible says in Matthew, when Jesus is talking to people about this idea of sexual sin, he says this, You have heard it said you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
anybody that you look at to commit adultery with, Jesus says that sin has already happened here. And so if we were all honest to level the, the, the playing field, we are all guilty in this auditorium for those who have reached a mature age. We all are guilty of sexual sin because every adult in this room, I guarantee at one time or another, either in the past, in the present, maybe in the future, has struggled with sexual sin and lust in the heart. You see, sexual sin objectifies people. It uses people. It disregards the sacred for merely using and abusing. The human body becomes nothing more than a sweet drink that after being consumed, the empty shell is thrown away and discarded in the trash. And that's where we find ourselves in John chapter 8. We find ourselves with the religious elite using a woman for the sake of their own personal gain. The Pharisees are coming to Jesus. Jesus had descended to a mountain. He comes down. He steps into the temple. There are thousands of people in the temple. And, and look what it says here in John chapter 8, starting with verse 2. It says, early in the morning, he came again to the temple, and all the people were coming to him. They're coming to learn from Jesus. They're coming to hear what he has to say. They're coming to hear what he has to teach them. And it says, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. The first point that I'm going to talk about this morning is sexual immorality is a sin because it violates the sacred holiness and purpose God intended for his creation. Now, as a young man exposed to pornography at a very early age, that took deep root, and it took years of biblical study, years of counseling, years of following after Jesus and giving him my heart for me to overcome that sin that was so deeply rooted. And even today, in Job chapter 31, verse 31, it's, a, it's something that I try to impress upon my own heart and on my own mind. Job says this, I will not look lustfully upon a woman. And Covenant Eyes actually teaches this. It's called bouncing the eyes technique. And so just as, a, just as a little encouragement to you, one of the chief ways that you can battle against this idea, against this war of sexual sin, is training yourself to bounce your eyes. You see something that's attractive or that's lustful, you bounce your eyes to something that's different. And so what we have here is this idea of this woman being dragged before Jesus being dragged before the people by the religious elite to try to trick Jesus, to try to show him that he's really not the Messiah. And they have ulterior motives that we're going to look at, but let's first talk about a little bit more about what the Bible has to say about this idea of sexual sin. You see, in the Old Testament, adultery was punishable. It was punishable by death. You would be stoned to death if you were committed in adultery. And so maybe this woman um, was betrothed to marry someone, and here she's been caught by the religious leaders, and so they drag her, and they are, they're going to ask Jesus, should we, should we stone this woman? But this is an obvious moral law that adultery is wrong. You see, this death penalty was contextual to the nation of Israel. We don't execute people in the Christian church. We don't execute people in America for committing adultery, but that doesn't mean the moral law of adultery is no longer in existence just because we've changed how we deal with adultery. You see, the reason why God had them execute people for committing adultery is because he needed complete and utter moral separation. The nation of Israel, their purpose was to bring about the Messiah, and one of the ways to keep the nation holy was not to intermarry with other nations, and was also not to commit adultery, because God knew the essence of the home, the essence of a strong marriage, of a strong family, meant the health and the maturity and the prosperity of a nation. When you start to deteriorate and remove the ideal of marriage, when you start to remove the essence of a, of a, of a marriage relationship to be nothing more than just some casual relationship, when we degrade that, the nations will crumble. And also, thirdly, this moral idea in the Old Covenant, it was that. It was an old covenant practice. It was an old covenant teaching. And that's something that we don't do today. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 that the old covenant was made obsolete with the establishment of the new. And so we deal with sexual sin a lot differently in the church today than what they did in the Old Testament. But committing adultery and sexual sin, nevertheless, is shameful. It is morally wrong. It is unacceptable for the Christian. Let me read to you a few verses about what the New Testament has to say about sexual morality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20, Paul writes this, Flee immorality. Every other sin 
that a man commits is outside of the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body? Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you uh, have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Our bodies are not our own. Our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. This is not the sanctuary. Sometimes people refer to this as the sanctuary. This is not the sanctuary of God, right? This, this is an auditorium. We are the sanctuary. We are the house of God, and he lives inside of us. And so what Paul commands us here is flee, run from it. There are some sins that we should fight against. There are some sins that we should personally stand up against. But when it comes to sexual sin, the Bible says run, and there's a reason In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and 21b, the Bible says this, The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, which is drunkenness. Paul says in verse 21, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. To be a Christian who is unashamed, committed to sexual sin, means that you are giving up your right to walk in the inheritance of the kingdom of God. Again, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, and verse 5, it says this, and this is the standard here. This is a beautiful verse about sexual morality and the standard that God has in place for the church. Look what it says. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality, nor any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people, not a hint. You mean it's not okay to look at the menu and just not order? That's absolutely right. You mean it's not okay to look at a woman with lust just as long as you don't act upon that lust? Absolutely. You cannot look at a woman with lust or a man with lust and role play that movie in your head of sexual sin and expect God to be okay with that. And that's really what lust is. We all have desires. We all have natural instincts. We all have inclinations. I mean, for a handsome man to walk by you women and for you to notice him instinctively is not in itself wrong, right? So if you're looking at me and you're like, wow, Rick's a really handsome guy, that's not really bad. (laughs) Just kidding. But here's the deal, for you men too, right? You see a beautiful woman who's created by God, right? An artful masterpiece of God. It's not shameful to think, wow, what a beautiful woman. Those things aren't wrong. Here's the problem, is when we take that image and we begin to role play it in our mind, right? And we don't push stop on the movie. That's what lust is. And so Paul says, there shouldn't even be a hint of immorality, sexual, mentioned among you. And he says in verse five, for of this you can be sure, that no immoral or impure or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of our God. Man, what a reality check. That's something that is so prevalent in our culture that so many people struggle with. The Bible says you can't inherit the kingdom of God if you are living a willful life of sexual sin. And then finally, we as Christians... We who claim to follow Christ, can we go on living our lives totally unashamed of living in sexual sin? And how do we deal with this? Well, look what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. He says, but now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or a sister, but who is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slander or a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. I mean, what a very clear statement. He's not talking about people in the world. We all work with and eat with and associate with people who are completely lost and do not know Jesus. And Paul goes on to say, I'm not telling you not to associate with those people, with those who are outside of Christ. He says, you'd have to leave the world. But people who pledge to follow Jesus, people who have Jesus living inside of them, people who claim to be devoted utterly and entirely to Jesus, don't eat with people who are living in sexual sin. Don't associate with them. The reason is why. Why can't we associate? Why is this sexual sin such a big deal? Well, I think just clearly and simply, it's because it's a big deal to God. And we as a Christian uh, culture, as a church, we have to create a standard of holiness that when we give our lives to Christ, we should really mean it. 
Now let me make a clarification here, okay? I think there is a distinction. There is a distinction between a 17-year-old young man who's given his life to Christ and struggles with looking at porn, doesn't want to do it. There is a difference between that guy and a 17-year-old boy who's given his life to Christ who thinks viewing porn is just no big deal. I was looking up a, a, a research statistic, Barna Group, 56% of young adults believe that uh, not, um, what's the word, not recycling is wrong morally. Only 17% of them believe that looking at porn was immoral. They believe that not recycling, now this was a, a general survey, not recycling is more immoral than looking at pornography. What a degrading and detrimental blow to our culture. and and to our idea of of what sex is. And sex is a beautiful, wonderful, awesome, amazing thing that God has given us, but our culture has waged war against it to abuse it and manipulate it and and bring it down. And so that's why we as Christians, we have to be strong on on this idea of sexual sin. And there are different types of sexual sin. I've already mentioned one, adultery. When you are committed in a marital relationship, any form of sexuality outside of the marriage bed is sin. Fornication. This is sex before marriage, outside and before marriage in any sexual form. Homosexuality, right? Whether it's in marriage or out of marriage, the Bible is very clear. This type of sexual sin is wrong. Bestiality. Sexual acts with animals. This is sinful. This is wrong. And then pornography. Sexual pleasure through images, videos, nightclubs, movies, magazines, and the like, these things are wrong. And as Christians, we have a standard of honor, of holiness. And sexual morality is so painstakingly sinful because it dishonors the marriage covenant that God instituted and gave. It makes it dirty. It degrades it. It's a sin against your body because you belong to Christ. It destroys God's purpose in your life. Paul writes in in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, God's purpose for your life is for you to be sexually pure. It saturates God's purpose for your life with sin, and it brings death into destruction to your happiness with God. It destroys God's salvation for your life. We already read that. Those who live in sexual sin cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It destroys the harmony of the church. I can't tell you how hurtful it is to the church body when marriages don't work out, when marriages are ruined over sexual sin. It hurts us. It destroys our harmony. Our church needs strong, healthy, vibrant marriages. It destroys the honor and the pleasure of marriage. And that's what's so dangerous about sexual sin is that these people that we look at now become objects of our own gratification We use and abuse when we steal their body, their pleasure, their marriage, their sexuality, and we rob it for our own. And that's why sexual sin, it's so dangerous. It inserts jealousy and envy and comparison, which is the thief of joy. How many women have been so ruined because their husbands have looked at pornography and they've seen those things and now all they can think about is, am I as beautiful as them? And the same thing is true for men as well. And that's why sexual sin is so hurtful. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says this, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. God wants your marriage to be holy. God wants your marriage to be pure. Because God knows what's best, does he not? He knows what's best for us. So we're picking up this story again where they have absolutely, if this woman is committing adultery, they are absolutely justified in calling it out. But what's the problem? The problem is their motives are misplaced. The problem is their approach is misplaced. They're going about it the wrong way. They're trying to trap Jesus. And that's what it says in John chapter 8, picking up back with me in verse 5. It says this, Now in the law of Moses, God commands us to stone such women. What do you say? What do you think, Jesus? How should we treat this? In verse 6, it says, They were saying this to test him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, and he wrote on the ground. That's a funny response. Scholars don't know what he was writing or why he decided to write. They take a thousand guesses. Um, But instead of answering them, right, he starts to write on the ground. Jesus knows their hearts. He sees their mind. He knows their attitudes, just like every single person in this auditorium. Jesus knows your thoughts. Jesus knows. 
And if you're sitting there thinking, my marriage is great, I'm sexually pure, I, I don't deal with this issue, you've probably struggled with it in the past and are in denial, uh, or you know, whatever else is going on in your mind, but Jesus knows he sees inside of our intuitions, our hearts, and our desires. He knows what these people are doing and what they're going to try to trick him into. And so he writes on the ground, and here's the second point that we're going to talk about this morning, is that sexual sin is a trap because of the moral, cultural decay, a sex-saturated world, and a scandalous reputation for the church. You see, the culture of Israel here, it was um, a time of, in John chapter 7, verse 2, it's, it's a time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is cool. What they would do is they would camp out in tents in celebration of being in the wilderness and living in tents. And so everyone would set up tents and they would stay in it. And here they've caught this young lady, right, out in a big party. Everyone's camping out. Why not, right? She's out there. Nobody knows. I might be off in a different community. And, and so they're celebrating and they're rejoicing. But Israel has gone through moral decay. And what I mean by that is this. God's law is no longer a standard. They're not stoning women for being caught in adultery. I mean, they have a half-breed leading as the, as the king of Israel. They're under Roman rule. Rome executes people. Rome is now the authority, not Israel. In fact, you have to go to the Roman magistrate in order to get um, approval and in order to get permission to execute anyone. And so they're not fooling anybody here. They probably hadn't stoned a woman in ages, right? And so they're bringing this lady in to try to trick Jesus. But the, the culture is in complete um, decay. And that's why God sent John the Baptist. John the Baptist came preaching and teaching a baptism of repentance. Come back to God, repent, and turn back to the law. Because the law was holy, the law was good, and the law leads people to Jesus. And it says that they were trying to trap Jesus. They say, Jesus, what do you, what do you say about this? And so Jesus is stuck, right? right? These Pharisees think they're so smart. Jesus is stuck. So if he says, stone the woman, now he loses uh, approval with the masses, we haven't stoned anybody in a long time. Here's Jesus. Now we got to go back and stone people. Remember, there's also moral decay, right? These people aren't following the law. And so Jesus is going to come across as some legalistic mandate who now has, more importantly, taken the place of Roman rule. Remember, Rome was responsible for executing people. And so they believe they put Jesus in a trap. If he says stone her, now he's taking charge over Roman rule and he will be executed. But if he says no big deal, what's the other problem? He's violating God's law. Doesn't Leviticus say that a woman caught in adultery should be stoned? So now he's at odds. But instead of answering them, he kneels down on the ground and he just starts drawing. I think that that is so funny. But before we move on, let's take a brief look at our own American culture. Right? Don't be so old school. Marriage is such a waste of time. That's for all those old, weird Christians. You know, it's no big deal. I don't want to make my life miserable. Um, and so here are some populated reasons why people should live in sexual sin. Divorce in the church is worse than it's ever been. In fact, believe it or not, divorce in the church has now out-divorced uh, the world. And that is, that is a true statement. Divorce in the church has shown that Christians all across the board, have failed at this ideal of marriage, or at least carrying it out. But to say that marriage is wrong is logically false, right? We talked about this last week. Authority is a good thing. And to say that government is wrong is, is, is a logically false thing. The carrying out of the government is the issue, not authority in and of itself. It's the same thing with marriage. You don't do away with what God instituted because we fail at it, right? Right? So divorce is not an option. It is not good. It is not healthy. Marriage works. But here's the second, here's the second reason. Marriage only complicates things. We're happy now. Why not stay happy? And this is a huge lie. Nine times out of ten, it usually comes from the male partner. But marriage is meant to secure both commitments from both partners. It protects each individual morally from sexual disease and financially from abandonment. And so Complicating things with marriage is, shows a total false understanding of a commitment in a relationship. How about this one? Don't you want to test it before you buy it, right? We've all heard that one before. The Bible says you've become one with a person when you have sexual relations with, uh, with them. It is an intimate attachment that takes place. And then you want to rip that apart? You want to tear it apart because you want to test drive it before you buy it and you decide that you don't like it and so you'll just move on to something that works for you? It shows that virginity is no big deal. Virginity is nothing. Sexual purity is nothing. 
It just becomes an abstract part of the relationship. And that is so false and such a satanic lie. Our sex uh, and our virginity and our holiness, it is a gift. It is a special, unique aspect of us to say, I pledge myself to you and only you until the day I die. That you can see every bare, naked part of me and love me the same. Man, how humiliating, right? Standing naked in front of someone is not the most fun thing to do. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's true. It's so embarrassing because you are so exposed and so vulnerable. And that's why sex is such an amazing, wonderful thing. Is because you're vulnerable with someone that you can trust. That's what the Bible has to say about sex. How about this? Sex is no big deal. Don't make it more than it is. To say such a terrible thing is to be totally numb to the unique and special and wonderful gift that God has given us. Sex is the biggest deal in our relationship. It is the most intimate that you will ever be with a person. And some of you may be sitting there squirming in your seats because you're like, I am totally uncomfortable right now. And that's okay. Because it shows how far the church has come and our ideals of marriage and sex. I mean, think about this. Parents will freak out if, if their kids are taught about sex in the church. But all they have to do is open up their Bible. The Bible is full of stories about relationships, about sexual abuse. Jesus Christ himself was stripped naked on a cross. His face was smothered and covered with a robe as they beat him, exposed naked. Jesus can identify with those who have fallen victim to sexual abuse. The Bible is full of Old Testament stories talking about David and Solomon who had totally ridiculous relationships with women, but yet God used them for his glory. David himself, a man after God's own heart, stole a woman from a man who was married and then sent him off to be killed so that he could have her for his own. Scandalous, right? You even look through the New Testament about people and dealing with this culture of sexual sin. We read 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians had this huge temple that was dedicated to this goddess Diana who was the god of sex. She was the god of sex. They would have women sitting out on the streets and men who were temple prostitutes. And Paul says sexual relationships matter to God. And the whole letter is filled with it. We just read in chapter 5 this man who was committing sexual sin. And Paul says you need to not associate with this person in order to bring him back to God. Bring shame upon him so that he'll realize what he's doing is dark and sex matters. The church has to take a stand on this idea of sex. Because when we create a culture of shame, when we create a culture of embarrassment and humiliation, and we don't educate and teach within the right context, I'm not saying we need to teach sex to our second grade class, okay? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that moms and dads, right, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to be able to teach God's word and what it says within the right moral context. We have to trust our church leaders and trust that God knows what he's talking about. And I can tell you, as a young man, I never got a sex talk. In fact, the only time I ever got a sex talk was after I did something wrong, completely wrong. I was exposed to pornography in the fifth grade. I wrote a pornographic comic book, and I got in trouble. I got suspended for three days, completely humiliated. I didn't know that that was against God. I didn't know what God had expected between a husband and a wife, what sex really was, and I was, I was inquisitive. And so because my parents didn't talk to me about it, because the church didn't teach me, do you know where I turned? Google, my friends, my music, my movies. And so now I'm working from a deteriorated, sinful perspective on relationships and marriage and sex rather than what God's word has to say. And that's why we have to take a stand. That's why we have to stand up for this idea of holiness and the confinements and the context of God's word. And then there's this idea of redefining marriage in our culture. Dr. Frank Turek writes this in his book, and I suggest for you to get it. Um, he says, the truth is that the evidence from other countries over a much longer period shows a mutually reinforcing relationship between same-sex marriage and illegitimacy, right, and redefining marriage, and the disastrous results of 40 years of liberalized divorce laws shows how monumentally important marriage laws are to health of marriages, children, and the nation, so we have a responsibility here, church, and that's the third point that I want to talk about under this, under this second point, is that the church has really dropped the ball on this. 
We have really failed. And I'm talking about the church at wide. And not everybody that calls themselves a Christian is a Christian. But think about this. Instead of celebrating and teaching, we've made it a dirty little secret that shouldn't be heard, saw, or touched. Did you know that your children begin getting educated on sex in the sixth and sometimes fifth grade? We're talking about 11, 12, and 13-year-olds are being taught by the public school system. When do we teach on that in the church? Parents, when's the last time you really sat down and said, hey, what do you think about this? Tell me your thoughts about it. Removing the culture of shame. The statistics against the church are undeniable. Divorce is a problem, and we've done a poor job in Christianity as a whole fighting for marriage. We've got to be a family church. That's, that's our theme. That's our, our vision, is to be a family church where your life matters. And that will be built and centered and grounded and focused on strong marriages and relationships. Because it promotes and sustains a healthy society, healthy families, a healthy church. Paul predicted about this war against marriage. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, he says this. But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter, latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience. And look what they'll do here. In verse 3, it says, Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. They'll forbid marriage. They'll fight against it. The ideal that God has set. And this has been carried about by a few different ways. You can forbid marriage by doctrine and dogma. Uh, dogma. There are some religious institutions which do not allow people to marry. And this causes what? Rape child abuse, sexual scandals. God created marriage for us, but some people come along and say, no, you can't do that. We're going to tell you what to do. And Paul says, look, Timothy, these people are coming. They're going to forbid marriage and doctrine. We can forbid marriage by declaration and government. We can redefine what marriage is. We can forbid marriage and job description of the church. We can make the preacher, the ministers, the staff so busy they don't have time to share their marriage and grow their marriage. The best thing for this church is not only for our church members to have a strong marriage, but for ministers to have a strong marriage. We need to be strong together. And I can't tell you how many ministers I've known. They've been so busy, they've neglected their families, that their own marriage has deteriorated and fallen apart. In the same way, we have these Pharisees. They're trying to trick Jesus. And guess what? Satan tries to trick the church. He'll bring us brokenhearted teenagers who's discovered they're pregnant. He'll bring us single mothers who's been divorced numerous times. He'll bring us poor and addicted men who are lost in the darkness of sin. How will we respond? What is the church's call? Look at what Jesus did. How did he respond in John chapter 8, verse 7? It says, but when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw the stone at her. Again, he stooped down and rode on the ground, and when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on and sin no more. And so here's our final point as we discuss being free from sexual sin, is that sexual traps are opportunities for God's grace and glory to be revealed. You see, the first thing is that it points to God as the judge of another person's guilt. Who's without sin, Jesus says. Here are some stones. The Old Testament says to stone her. Go ahead, pick up the first stone. And I can just imagine them sitting there looking at Jesus like, we thought we trapped him and he got out of it again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, darn, we thought we had him. And, and, and so they're silent. And did you notice who leaves first? It's the old men. Why do you think the old men leave first? They know. They know what it's like to live a life and struggle and fall short of God's glory and sin and make mistakes. And they leave first. And one by one, the crowds are watching. I can imagine it just being dead silent. Everybody stops what they're doing because these Pharisees have come to make a scene. And Jesus teaches them. But he expresses the, the, the glory and the honor that God alone can judge a person's guilt. So we need to point to the word. If you want to help somebody out and encourage them, point to the word. It also points to the perspective of our own personal sin. 
When they heard it, one by one, they left. As I said at the beginning of this message, we are all guilty. Every person in this room has struggled at one point in time with either sexual sin or another sin just as grievous, and that's why these men left. It was like Jesus saying, look, you're bringing this woman before me? You're guilty of the same thing. You're guilty of the exact same thing. And rather than restoring this woman and trying to encourage her and help her, they want to use and abuse her for their own glory, for their own usage. And that's something that they should be ashamed about. You see, we've got to create a culture that enables God's grace to work in the lives of people. You see, the point isn't about whether or not somebody sinned. The point isn't about whether or not we shouldn't deal with sin. The point is how we deal with a person's sin, especially when it comes to sexual sin. So look at some verses here that I have for you. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to just merely just kind of go through them very quickly. Matthew 7, 5 says, You hypocrites, take the log out of your own eye before you try to remove the speck in in somebody else's. If you want to help people get sexually pure, you've got to do it yourself first. You've got to take that log out and leave it far behind and move forward. But how do you move forward without being a hypocrite? Number two, Galatians 6.1 says, If anyone's caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual should restore such a person in the spirit of gentleness. And watch out, because you too might be tempted. Man, what is the worst thing that you can do than bring somebody up and reprimand and shame them in the spirit of anger and the spirit of judgmentalism rather than being gentle? Man, we've all made mistakes, haven't we? We need to create a culture of grace 2 Corinthians 7b, this man in 1 Corinthians 5 that was caught in sexual sin, look what Paul writes. He says, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. Let me say something. If you're struggling with sexual sin, the last thing we want you to do is walk out of this auditorium, leave and go home and feel like you can't find healing and help. One of the best things that you can do is to call me, call another minister, reach out to a Christian brother and say, look, I am struggling with something. If you're a woman, latch on to a spiritual woman, a pastor's wife, uh, or a minister's wife and say, look, I am struggling with this. I need help. Expose the sin. Get out of the darkness. And for those of you who have the opportunity to help restore someone, do it in the spirit of gentleness. We have got to help each other overcome this war against the sexuality and the purity of God with comfort and love and gentleness because Jesus saves. And look at 2 Thessalonians 3.15. Do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Right? We're part of a family. And we make mistakes. And we mess up. And we fail. And I have failed many, many times, and I probably will in the future. But I want to honor God, and I want to follow him. And if we are going to be a family church where your life matters, we have to be willing to love and encourage each other, even through sexual sin. And if you look at Jesus' ministry, if you look at the message that Jesus taught about and that he shared with people, it was this, I am here to save. I'm not here to call the perfect and the righteous. I am here to save people who have messed up, who have fallen short. You see, it's unloving not to point out the future judgment of God. But we are in the spirit and dispensation of grace, not judgment. Look at John chapter 3, verse 17. It should be up on the screen for you. It says this, For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Again, in John 12, 27, it says, If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. If you've messed up, If you've made mistakes, the message is this. Jesus is here to save you from those mistakes. If you've been divorced, if you're struggling with pornography, if you've messed up sexually, God is here to save us. Let's just take a moment to pray for him. God, help him, Lord. Whatever he's going through, be with him, God. Heal whatever he's struggling with, Lord. Let your spirit of healing and peace come upon him. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us your son. In Jesus' name, amen. 
You know, I think about Jesus writing on the ground here, right? I kind of mentioned that. Some scholars believe that he was writing out the, uh, the response when they asked Jesus a question. He was writing it out. Um, and remember, the temple wasn't a, just a big concrete place. They had sand and dirt and things like that. Other scholars believe he was writing out the Ten Commandments. You want to quote to me the old law? Well, guess what? I created the law. And he's writing out the Ten Commandments, and he stands up to give his answer. And regardless of what they believe that Jesus is writing, I, I think about, I was like, I wonder if Jesus were here today, and he would see all of us and hear me teach, I wonder what Jesus would write on the ground to us. You know, what would he say? And I think that if Jesus were to write anything, he would draw in big, huge letters, not guilty, set free, forgiven, go and sin no more. And why is it that Jesus says, go and sin no more? You are set free. I've forgiven you for this. How many of us say, no, Jesus, you don't understand. I've done a lot of bad stuff. I have really made a lot of mistakes. I've been divorced several times. I've had sex with many partners. I haven't honored you. You don't understand. I've done a lot of wrong. But yet Jesus says, go and sin no more. But you see, it can't be that easy. I've made too many mistakes. I'm too gone. I'm too far off to be forgiven. I'm too exposed. I deserve punishment and wrath. And God says, no, I have forgiven you. Go and sin no more. You know, Jesus was hung on a tree of shame. And if you look at the study of the cross and what Jesus went through, one of the healing natures of the cross is that Jesus can identify with people who were abused sexually. And a lot of people, they don't, you never think about this because you kind of think about the beatings and the crucifixion. But when Jesus was whipped, he was stripped naked and they beat him in public in front of other people. And then they, they pushed a crown of thorns on his head and they, they covered him in this robe. And then when they took him to be nailed on a cross, um, you didn't get nailed on a cross with your clothing on. They would put you up there and then they would take your clothes off and you had to lay there in complete humiliation and in complete shame. That's what Jesus went through. And you know, I think about that and I think about my sin and my struggles and where I've fallen short and Jesus was willing to go through that for me and he's willing to forgive me and he's willing to forgive you too. And that's why we're here is because this is what the Lord's Supper is all about, that this cup that you're going to receive is the blood of Jesus and this, this bread is his body and that we remember God has forgiven us even for the darkest and most horrible sins that we've committed in our past and that we've made mistakes for. God has set us free. And so what we need to do is as this time that we pass the, the, the communion is to remember what his sacrifice is for us, to let God enable us to have grace, to enable us to give others grace as we walk through life together, to move forward, to live on into eternity and to remove the shame, I am free. And so that's what I want you to do as you pass the communion to each other, is remember, you are free, you've been forgiven. God, thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for loving us, teaching us, helping us. God, I pray that as we observe your body and your blood, God, I pray that we'll remember that you broke yourself for us that you want to heal us, that you want us to pick up our, our garbage, our shame, and our sin, throw it behind us, and walk towards you. God, I pray for this church. I pray for this family, for this community. I pray for these marriages. God, I pray for our future as a church, as your kingdom, that we can love one another just as you have loved us. God, thank you for sending your son to die for us. Thank you for helping us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.